Hope you had a nice Thanksgiving. I know I did. Got to go down to Tacoma and see my family. We had all the nephews and nieces. There was a moment that I looked at my dad's eyes, and he had that look that said, help. I said, who wants to go to Walmart? Took all the kids to Walmart. And so that was interesting. Um, found out adults still cut in line. And so I'm, I'm getting over it, but you know who you are. God knows too. So we, uh, yeah, that was a, a fun time to be with family. And uh, of course, uh, I think we should take a moment. Uh, we've been uh, baptizing people all this morning. Each person who's baptized, uh, their gospel message of being baptized points to Jesus as the hero, God making all things new. Let's celebrate with those who are baptized today and say, well done. We're so proud of you. So um, we, uh, some of you know for this Christmas season, Outrageous Christmas, a couple of things we're doing. One is the Christmas Angel, and you heard about that. That's local. Globally, we're doing something called Walk for Water. And last year, 76 people did the first ever Walk for Water, where we walked two and a half miles, picked up 40 pounds of water, and walked back, and identified with what one billion people in the world have to do, and that is go for water. And uh, because uh, much of that is unclean water, uh, every 19 seconds, a child in the world dies from a water-related disease. By doing this walk for water, we raised money last year for a well. A well costs about $12,000 to do a deep, clean, uh, our deep, well, deep, clean water well. And so uh, this year, we have a goal of doing more of them. Uh, there's four places where we could do them. There are villages where there are schools in Burkina Faso, West Africa. And so we're going to just do as much as we can. All of our campuses are jumping in. If you haven't got your Walk for Water stuff, grab it out in the lobby. How much fun would it be for your family to do it? Uh, we said make a goal to raise $100. Some will do more. If you do less, come on out. Um, but there's actually, we did ones where the kids had smaller containers to carry. I had Clara carry mine. And so <laughs> I didn't do that. So... It's, it'll be at the uh, Silverdale Waterfront December 14th, that morning, and we have from now until then to raise money. We'll do the best that we can, and it's going to make a huge difference. I was talking to Tom Cornell. He's the leader at our North Mason campus. It's he and his friends that live in Burkina Faso that are uh, building these schools uh, where there's a, a need for wells so that kids don't have to decide, do I go for water today or go to school? And uh, he said just this past week, four kids got sick. And because they just, uh, they don't have the access to the clean water. And so we said, well, we want to make a difference. We want to do something about that. So I'm so excited. I'll be doing it again this year and hope to see you there on December 14th. Um, how many have ever been to our Christmas Eve gatherings before? Christmas Eve, who's been there before? Um, could you just look at everyone that didn't raise their hand and go, what's your deal? <laughs> um, uh, we will be sharing uh, the Christmas message with our community um, we're actually going to start Christmas Eve Eve. Go ahead and say that. Christmas Eve Eve with the Jingle Jam. First ever Jingle Jam, 10 a.m. will be um, our actual superhero Christmas for all the kids. If your kids went to kids camp, they're going to want to be there for superhero Christmas. And then that night will be our first Christmas gathering at 6 p.m. And then on Christmas Eve, 7, 9, and 11. And we'll, um, the stage will be pushed back and we'll have room for everybody that will be coming on that special time where we share the message of the gospel uh, with our friends in the community. So uh, with that, um, this, what's been on my heart to talk about during this Christmas season is to talk about uh, how outrageous the Christmas story is. And I just think we've gotten used to it. And, and today we're going to take a fresh look at the Christmas story. And what, you know, I was just thinking, if you didn't know the story and someone shared it with you, at what point would you stop and just go, you're making that up? <laughs> and so let's look at it again with fresh eyes. If you're taking notes, our big idea coming on the screen is this. Christmas is so outrageous that we must live outrageously. And you can see on the stage, we have uh, OutrageousChristmas.com, and uh, we'll be talking more about that in a little bit. That's our theme for this month, Outrageous, because I just think the Christmas story is so outrageous, and we've just forgotten. I mean, okay, so you sit down, and somebody is sharing the Christmas message with you, and like, here's how the story goes. What point would you just go, no way, that's outrageous? And I think the first thing I wrote is this, a pregnant teen gives virgin birth. I mean, come on. Who else do you know that said they had a baby, got pregnant, but they were a virgin? I mean, isn't that a point where you just go, no way. That would have to take a miracle. 
Yet scriptures say this in Matthew. This is how Jesus the Messiah was born. His mother Mary was engaged to be married to Joseph. But before the marriage took place, while she was still a virgin, she became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, okay, we're going to do something today that involves some participation on your part. I know that excites you. This is what I call Christmas karaoke, and I don't sing well, so you'll want to sing loudly. But I want us to think about some of these songs we sing and the stuff in them that's so outrageous, but we sing right past it like it's no big deal. So our first song is going to be Silent Night, okay? So, all right, loud voices, everybody. Silent night, holy night. Come on, bleachers. All is calm, all is bright. Here we go. Round yon virgin mud. Huh? Stop. Round yon virgin. Round yon virgin and all is calm? I don't think so. No way. Okay, like in that culture, different than our culture, the way you got married was arranged marriages, which I think personally we should bring them back. And imagine this, Mary's going to tell her parents, mom and dad, I'm pregnant, but don't, don't worry, I'm still a virgin, it's the Holy Spirit. Like who, are you, that's outrageous. I mean, the shame upon a family that you have a daughter who's pregnant. Now, in that culture, it was a little bit different in the sense of this, the average life expectancy, about, about the age of 40 in the life of Jesus. Some would live much longer, but because of war and famine and sickness and so forth, about 40 years old. And so because of this, because of survival, what would happen is that the man would be a little bit older when he got married, so he had a job and career and could provide, and the woman would be much younger so that she has all of her childbearing years. So teenage, not that big a deal, but pregnant virgin, round yon virgin, the shame upon a family. Not just that. Imagine if you're Joseph. Honey, um, I know we're engaged and stuff, but um, I'm pregnant. And he's like going, well, no, it's not me. Uh-oh. And in that culture, I mean, it'd just be punishable by death. And engagements were different that day. The way an engagement would work is this. In our culture, you know, you like get engaged to see if you want to be married. In their culture, you got engaged because you were going to get married. It would take a divorce to be unengaged. A little bit different than getting your ring back in your sweatshirt. <laughs> you got to get a sweatshirt back. And so um, for, 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 for Mary to tell Joseph this, um, he has to make a decision. Is he going to distance himself from her? But what he does, because he's a man of integrity, he decides he's going to divorce her quietly. And I, if it was me, like, okay, Carrie and I remember when we got engaged, and, you know, I can still remember that. And I can just imagine we're engaged, and she comes to me, and she says, um, honey, don't get mad, but I'm pregnant, but it's God. I, I don't think I believe her. I mean, you, you guys met my wife. She's sweet. Is she sweet? Yeah. She's pure. Is she pure? She's nice, right? You meet her, you meet me, you're like, how? <laughs> right? Still, I wouldn't believe her. It would take an angel of the Lord to show up, and that's exactly what happened with Joseph, and said, this really is, the, your wife is pregnant, it's the Holy Spirit, she's giving you birth to the Messiah, the Son of God. And um, it just reminds me that God's way of doing things are in our ways, that God does things in ways that only he can get the credit if you go back 700 plus years, Isaiah the prophet writes this. All right, then the Lord himself will give you a sign. Look, the virgin will conceive a child. She'll give birth to a son and we'll call him Emmanuel, which means God's, God with us. The Christmas story suggests a virgin birth as part of Christmas. No way. That's outrageous. Second thing I wrote down is this is uh, another outrageous thing is that God is born as a human being. Think about it, the creator of the universe becoming a baby. I'm thinking, okay, if I were, okay, put my place, I'm God and I'm going to show up on earth. I'm thinking, make an appearance, have an entourage. I'm thinking some flowing robes coming down, like, what's up? I mean, I'm just something that just dropped, born as a baby in a little village, a town called Bethlehem. Are you kidding? That's outrageous. 
that God became flesh. Philippians is a, a, a creed, a song that was sung by the church to pass on doctrine. And there, Paul writes to the church, you must have the same attitude that Jesus Christ had, and here's the song. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God, something to, be, to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death. See, of everything it took for God to come near, that God had to put on human flesh, be born as a baby. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. We saw His glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. And you think about like how hard is it for us to put on certain things. I mean, our, our, our culture was so fashion conscious, so worried about what others might think. Anybody ever get a gift, you open the gift, and you look at it and you go, oh, no. I was talking with my mom about the time my grandma, um, she made me, she knitted me, I mean, incredible amount of love and time, and she knitted, she crocheted me a sweater vest. And, and as a I was a teenager, right? And so as I open this up, I look at this and I go, oh no, I'm going to have to wear this once. And my mom said, that's true. And in fact, I had to wear this to this Christmas party, and it was at Grandma Luter's house, and it's already 90 degrees. I got a nosebleed. It's so hot. <laughs> Sweater. And I'm just thinking, like the whole time, I'm like, I don't want anyone to see me. I'm so embarrassed by this blue, blue, and blue, different shades of blue sweater vest. My grandma's looking at me saying, oh, I love him. I'm like, oh, it's just once. Okay, I'll get over it. And you think about we struggle to put on humility. We struggle to put on humility, but with joy, with joy, Jesus put on flesh. And God came near. And what would it look like for you to humble yourself this Christmas in some outrageous way and put on humility? The third thing I wrote is this. The first eyewitnesses are unclean, impure, and irreligious shepherds. I mean, again, we get to this part, we think, you know, no big deal. In fact, we even sing, go tell it on the mountain, which is probably, we probably should sing. Are you guys ready? Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Yeah, some of you guys are going, I cannot believe I came today. <laughs> we sing that song, Shepherds. The first witnesses to go and tell others, we're like, of course, it makes sense. Huh? Shepherds were seen as unclean, impure, and irreligious, the last people you think that God would show himself to. But the angels showed up to the shepherds who were watching their flock by night. Outrageous. Outrageous. Luke that night there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. Suddenly the angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. They were terrified, but the angel reassured them, don't be afraid. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. God chose shepherds to be the first eyewitnesses. You think about shepherds, they're so unclean. I mean, they live, they're sleeping with the sheep. Um, they're, they're not, they don't make their way to the temple and worship because of their job, I'm sure, and also if they showed up there. I mean, think about it. They watch sheep, and what do you do at the temple? You sacrifice lambs. So for them, that'd be like a business transaction, right? I mean, this is like the last people that you think are going to show up and be a part. And in most of our minds, we think this. If I was clean, if I was pure, if I was religious, then God would use me as a witness. And God's like, you've missed the point. You're not the hero. Jesus is the hero. God shows up right where you're at, where you are. There's something special in the heart of God about shepherds. When Israel was crying for a king, God said, you should be looking for a shepherd. When Ezekiel was prophesying about the lack of good shepherds amongst the nation, there were those who would not look for the lost, for the strays, for the sick, for the weak, for the injured. When David wrote his psalm, he said, the Lord is my shepherd. And when Jesus in John 10 chose to talk about himself, he said, I am the good shepherd. My sheep know my voice. They hear and they follow. There's something special in the heart of God about shepherds. When Jesus went to tell the gospel message and share it, the heart of God for every single person, he said, it's like there's a hundred sheep, one runs away, and the shepherd goes and finds that one lost sheep. And God loves every single person. There's something special about shepherds. Shepherds were tough guys. 
They had to be because there would be time a wolf or a bear would show up and they had to decide, am I a hired hand and I just kind of leave whenever it gets tough or am I going to battle off some of the evil? And there was something that God, and it made sense. Those would be the ones that would be the first witnesses. And Jesus said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses. Maybe you're here and you've thought this, I just don't know if I'm clean enough for God to use me. The message of the gospel is that God cleans you (laughs) and you become his witnesses. This isn't about how you get to God, Emmanuel, how he came to us. It's outrageous. It's outrageous. The fourth thing I wrote down is that a warrior king is born in a manger, which of course reminds me of another song. We should just give it a shot. You guys ready? Away in a manger, no crib for a bed, the little Lord. Oh, isn't that sweet? I always think I have little kids singing that, and you're like, oh, little Lord Jesus in the manger, of course. Do you know, like, okay, I'm reading a book. It's called Jesus in Middle Eastern Nights. And in the book, there's a missionary that has lived amongst the people in Palestine, small villages where culture takes a long, long, long time, hundreds, hundreds, hundreds of years to shift. And so the people there have maintained some of the culture that you see there in the New Testament. And so as he would tell them the gospel stories, what would happen is this is they would think, they would see it different. In fact, they laughed at parts that he didn't know was funny. Do you know what they thought was outrageous? That the Savior is born in a manger. The son of David, the Messiah, the warrior king, is born in a manger. Because when we hear manger, we think crib. And they hear manger, they think trough. Caesar Augustus issued a decree that uh, all the Roman world would be taxed and people would return to their homelands. And, and what Joseph and Mary went to Bethlehem, this small, small village. This why it's old little town. And we won't sing it this time. As they go to Bethlehem, of course, there's too many people for that small town for everybody. It's a little bit like going to Thanksgiving at your, like, you know, relatives, and you had to sleep on the couch. <laughs> Anybody sleep on the couch? Yeah, sorry. And so here they are, Mary and Joseph, no room. And in that culture, um, if you were wealthy, you had a separate house where you would um, store or barn for all the animals. But probably, this being a poor village, for the most part, you have two uh, room houses. And one would be the guest house, which would be at this point full. And the other house would be the li- other room would be the living room, which is sloped downward. And at the end of that room would be mangers. Why? Because at night, when it was cold and there were thieves, the animals came, and that's where they stayed. And that's where the Christ was born. We struggle to put on humility, but what would it look like for you this Christmas? to humble yourself and kneel at the manger. Outrageous, virgin birth, God in the flesh, unclean shepherds, a manger is where the Savior is born. Fifthly, I wrote down this, the first worshipers are mystic outsiders following a star. We three kings of Orient are Bearing gifts, we travel so far. I don't know the rest, but it's a good song. <laughs> you, you know, you, you think about this, and you just go, of course, it makes sense. There's these people, and we think there's three because there's three gifts, but they're coming, and they got this. And you know I mean, but think about it. Somebody shows up at your house, knocks on the door. They're from some other country, and they said they were following a star, and it ended up there. And I see they have some gold. I say, come on in, sure. I mean, this is outrageous. Have we gotten used to the Christmas story and we forgot that this took God? It was incredible that he used the lowly, he used the humble, he used the outsiders, he used those who saw themselves as unclean. These are, these are total outsiders. Their job, was like they were into astrology. They're following a star. We call them magi. Other translations of the Bible call them magicians. Unlikely. That God would choose them to be the very first worshipers. And every one of us probably at some point during the Christmas season exchanges a gift with somebody. And every one of those presents and every one of those gifts point to the gift of God, the grace of God, the Christ child, but also the gift of the Magi and the very first worship that Christmas. 
What would it look like for you this year to give a gift of gold, frankincense, and myrrh? To give a gift like clean water. To give a gift to a child that wouldn't get a gift. To give a gift that's outrageous. Some of you, you, you saw earlier the video of Ashley. Ashley's a new lifer who last year felt like God gave her a, a vision. Gave her a dream. And in this dream, what she would do is um, she would celebrate Christmas starting December 1st with 25 days of acts of kindness. And every day do something that was small. Something that, you know, was outrageous. Maybe it was large. Sometimes it might be paying for coffee for the person behind you. Other days it was just, you know, doing something for your neighbors. Maybe it was, you know, something larger. We might see something outrageous like giving a couple of dollars to a beggar. But perhaps what would happen if you were to invite that person to your home where you have three bathrooms, give them a shower, some coffee, and a sweater. And not my grandma's sweater. (laughs) What would it look like for us to live outrageously? The stars were something powerful in the scripture. When Abram didn't have any children, didn't look like he could have kids, God pointed him to the sky and said, do you see the stars in the sky? Those will be your descendants. I'm building for myself a family to heal this world. And Joseph thought that was about himself when he saw all the stars in the sky bowing down to his, not realizing this was God's way of showing him that his part of what he was going to do to be a witness where there was a godless nation. You see even Paul writing to the church that you are to shine like stars in a crooked and depraved generation and Jesus saying to let your light shine before men that they might see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. What would happen if this year you became a star that someone could follow and they could find themselves at the manger meeting the Christ? Twenty-five days, actually last year, personally did this and she was hoping a hundred of her friends would do it too. And what she found was this. Over 2,000 people joined in with her from 17 states and six countries. That's outrageous. And I said to Ashley, what if this year the whole church jumped in with you? So we are announcing today the launch, December 1st, of Outrageous Christmas. There's a website coming on the screen. It's outrageouschristmas.com. You can go on there today if you need ideas. You're like, hey, I'd like to do something outrageous, but I need some ideas. Bam. If you know of some needs, put them there. Say, here's a need that somebody has. If you want to go through the needs, you might find things that you might be able to do to be outrageous. Stories are places that you can share of what's maybe a way that you've heard of somebody being outrageous. And all for 25 days, we want to blow the minds of everybody in our community to point them to Jesus as the hero and the true message of Christmas. Are you with me? Every day, do something outrageous. In the lobby, there'll be stuff that you can grab to help spread the word. We're going to invite all of our community to join us for Christmas at New Life. The Walk for Water is going to be amazing, the, 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 the Christmas angel. But think about all of the stories that are going to happen that God might do because you see the face of Jesus in somebody that you meet. That's people becoming the church. You go from, I don't, I don't know if I believe in Jesus too. Now I see Jesus in the face of everybody I meet. And the Holy Spirit leads you to some outrageous acts. And we're going to do this together. Would you go ahead and stand with me? The band's going to come. This is outrageous Christmas. And this is a moment for us, if you're here, and maybe it's been a while since you've been in a setting like this, where you can say a prayer right where you're standing and tell God you're coming home. He's been searching for you, looking for you, waiting for you. He knows where you're at, but he's waiting for you to admit that you need his help. Honestly and humbly to come before him and say, God, I need you. For us as a church, this is a moment for us like the locker room of a football game. To look around at each other and go, for 25 days, what would it look like if we just lived outrageously, loved outrageously, This is a moment for you to just go, am I in on this? And what would it look like? All of our campuses, all of the gatherings here, and we just spread it to our friends and family and others who want to jump in, people in other states and countries, and celebrate Christmas the way it should be celebrated, unexpected, 
humble, outrageous, gracious love. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Christmas and this moment we have with you that you remind us that you came near. You were not waiting for us to get ourselves clean enough to come to you, but you appeared and you came in the humblest of fashions. And so we humble ourselves before you and admit our need of your grace. People in this room who've kind of folded their arms and pushed away, created some distance because they're hurting, they're broken, to be able to open their arms, to be embraced by your love and to say, I love you. You're free. You're healed. I'm making all things new. Have faith and believe and experience joy. I pray over your people to be sent out these 25 days to be led by your Holy Spirit to do outrageous things that point to you, Christ, as the Savior this Christmas. And so with joy we sing. In your name we pray. And everybody said, amen.